This is a Scraps Studio production. And this is Scraps by Electronic Medicines. And you're listening to our special mini-series, The Inflammatory Wanderer. A series where we go behind the very premise that urban legends describe as the discovery that spawned the entire bioelectronic medicine revolution. We also are going to take a very systematic route through history and characters that make this feel colorful, interesting and downright exciting. But we are going to do that by simply chronicling the journey of this one nerve through history. The nerve everyone describes as the wanderer. Yes, it is the very same nerve that starts off with clear degree of selectivity from the brain stem. One can even tease out the nerve fibers with precision in the location behind the ear inside the skull. But then the fibers join and mix in like a river being joined by its tributaries. Some people seek to understand. Some people think they understand. Some people who study it are just downright lucky. But we often forget the ones who contributed significantly to our understanding of this wandering nerve. This is The Inflammatory Wanderer, a Scraps original podcast that is going to lay it all bare for you so that you can understand the history, the way it really happened. Life is a circuitous path where we move from one place to another, picking up skills, experiences, victories, and undoubtedly disappointments along the way. We actively think of it, respond to it, react to it. And if we get conditioned to the oncoming information in a good way or bad, we make it a habit to live a certain way. And nerves, much like life, do this too. The classic example is the one that we call the wanderer not just in what it does, but in terms of its acquaintances that this nerve has made over human history. Do we really know how people have got to talk and mistalk about what they have known or discovered about this wanderer? To do this, we must go beyond the veil of what people have told you so far, pitch our tent beyond the fancy headlines, understand the practices that we are conditioned with that causes us to simplify, eulogize, or even villainize the people who have acquainted us with this wanderer. And through this episode and this mini-series, we are going to challenge some conventional mindset of us as human beings. We are going to endeavor to share that discovery of the wanderer's influence was not a singular event conceived by a single person. Instead, we hope to show you the foundations, the root system, the trunk and all of the branches of this powerful nerve that led to the rise and prominence of a few individuals and the renaissance of an entire field of research. We are going to peel the layers of the onion to expose these facts and values. I am Jojo Platt. I am Arun Sridhar. This is the Inflammatory Wanderer. Hey you! Yes, I'm talking to you, the podcast listener. Let me ask you a question. Can you tell me the last time that you know of that we eulogized and attributed even the most difficult concepts to a single eureka moment? Was it yesterday? Was it last week? Was it last month? We have this image of a human jumping out of a bathtub and running naked, shouting eureka, or an apple falling from a tree, or in the case of psychedelic medicine, the famous bicycle trip of Albert Hoffman. If you think you love this romanticized version, let me break this idea for you. Fortune and knowledge, or the attainment of it, always favors a prepared mind. None of these Eureka moments we described and romanticized happened as a brainwave. It was because the person who we attribute its discovery to was actively thinking about it. But there is a bit of a psychological aspect for us as readers, colleagues, peers, and even, dare I say, scientists. We love the idea of saying that this one person did this, play up their name and celebrate it. And in today's world, 
This aspect of playing up goes beyond the conferences and the plenary sessions that one attends. It spills into the news media and for the field that we are talking about, the field of how nerves control body function, we so easily forget all the people who came before us and pushed the field forward by a huge amount only to ensure that we hear it from someone else and we think that they were the godparents of that field. In some cases, we classify these moments as seminal moments. Many people had already thought of or had done meticulous experiments to understand and substantiate a finding, yet we know very little about it or much rather about them. And in presentations on this topic in today's field of science, we have lost the ability to attribute or acknowledge the contributions of all who came and contributed to that victory, except in the references of a manuscript that no one really worries about except for the reviewers in a journal. But people always acknowledge their lab members, Arun. Oh, that's not what I'm talking about, Jojo. It is about people not acknowledging the contributions of their peers. In some cases, not done adequately. Not just when they cite their papers, but in fact, I think it should go beyond that. Let's move beyond peers to even their competitors. In fact, one can argue that competitors push you to greater heights than peers. And, but somehow the story over time gets bungled up as a single seminal moment in one's individual personal history. And in, when in fact, this aha moment was really a culmination of several events and includes several people. And in our case, the field of bioelectronic medicine. Let's take this example. 30 years ago, I was training to be a neurosurgeon and I met a patient named Janice who changed my life. This is Dr. Kevin Tracy. He was a young surgeon at this time and was taking care of this girl, Janice. It was a normal day in New York. Young Janice, a toddler at the time, was playing on the kitchen floor of her grandma's house. On that fateful day, Janice was at her grandmother's house while her grandmother cooked dinner for the family, her traditional spaghetti. Janice was playing on the floor as grandma prepared her traditional spaghetti dinner. She had switched off the stove under the pasta water. She lifted the vessel off the stove and moved to strain it at the sink. And as she was moving the hot vessel, a little hand touched her leg, and right there, calamity struck. Grandmother got startled and dropped the vessel, and the boiling hot water fell on this little kid, Janice, who was burnt by hot water. She was rushed to the hospital, grandma feeling absolutely horrendous, and a young neurosurgeon that we just described, Kevin Tracy, was taking care of her on a shift in the ER. A few days later, she was doing extremely well. And then all of a sudden, when everything seemed all right, things took a downturn. Janice crashed and Kevin held her up. Code blue. And all much to his dismay, to ER. the little girl breathed her last. That's a very crushing story that... And as per many of Kevin Tracy's talks, that particular incident drove him to look and focus on inflammation control in sepsis. And he did that. He focused a lot of his early career on testing molecules that dampen inflammation, applied them to regions of the brain to assess impact, etc. Until one day where vagus nerve stimulation seemed to be that answer. And the accolades followed. The press followed. So when we read these articles, what do we think? Press pieces such as these lead us to think that one person is solely responsible for the discovery of an entire field of research. In this case, it's Kevin Tracy and bioelectronic medicine. Like this one from New York Times. Kevin Tracy on putting it together after taking it apart. And another one from the same year titled, Can the Nervous System Be Hacked? That story was all about his patient, Morella, who was photographed with a vagus nerve implant that she received for rheumatoid arthritis. 
and the same story described a Bosnian truck driver as the first patient Kevin Tracy had. Identifying a single person as a discoverer appeals to us. We don't credit Columbus at all as discovering America. This one not only ignores Columbus's shipmates and benefactor, but completely ignores the fact that America was already inhabited, or even that Leif Erikson hit the old U.S. of A. 500 years prior to that fateful day in 1492. We don't include the quote-unquote little contributors, like the famous janitor that JFK found in the halls of NASA, who was doing his part to put a man on the moon. I like my origin stories to be nice and tidy, with a single date and a single name. I doubt that I'm alone here, but is this ever really true? Is what true, Jojo? That there's always this one singular seminal moment in our lives and this one instance of just one person's thoughts transformed the field of bioelectronic medicine from the garage play of neuroprosthetic players into this mainstream area. If you read the press releases and even some notable general public media, you have to wonder if there is some subliminal message that one person got there before anyone else without help from competitors, colleagues, or others. While a lot of money and investments might have hit a high spot in the early 2010s, the field of neuromodulation and bioelectronic medicine existed long before all of this happened. In fact, there might have been stories of people making their own luck and luck favoring those who were at the right place at the right time. But that suggests that using vagus nerve modulation to treat immunoinflammatory conditions like arthritis was something that was magicked out of someone's hat. So what I'm hearing you say is that there's more to the story. How do we go about understanding this? As humans, we always strive to nominate, celebrate, and even eulogize a single person as figurehead. Remember this guy? What will take place? What exactly is it? would be implanted in your skull. So you basically take out a chunk of skull, put the neural link device in there, you'd insert the electrode threads very carefully into the, the brain. It can interface basically anywhere, though it could be something that uh, you know helps cure, say, uh, eyesight. It returns your eyesight, even if you've like lost your optic nerve type of thing. Uh, could, really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hearing, obviously. Um, it, it could, in principle, fix almost anything that is wrong with the brain. Make no mistake that this type of narrative has captivated the audience around bioelectronic medicine. And as with the scientists and the innovators in the field, they tend to be split even within themselves. People say that this type of attention is needed, but at the same time, they claim some of what Elon Musk says is outrageous and have no means to offer any form of rebuttal. It's a love-hate relationship spawned on by PR machinery, working overtime, and it's managed to create lords and peasants within our otherwise even-tempered community. Now let's come back to the vagus nerve stimulation and the story of Kevin Tracy that we heard before. Everyone has a story. Every innovation has a story. I'm sure we have spoken a lot through our episodes on how people with chip on their shoulder, or sadness in this case, have centered their research careers around a calling of one sort or another. But the ways our psyche works in terms of media or even the way our PR apparatus works to portray one person as the figurehead who is a pioneer of everything in bioelectronic medicine is a bit, what can I say, icky or iffy depending on who you ask. Okay, you got me. Tell me more. If you pause and think about why we are even talking about this, it's because that I want to impress upon you, the listener, that knowledge of the vagus impacting brain activity was known for a long time. And it was this incremental knowledge progression that led to where we are today. And people don't talk about that openly because our current framework of conferences and plenary lectures wants us to keep us focused on the discoveries of the presenters or at least the people in the room. They do not tend to push for thanking or showing the work of people who came before us. In some cases, even our own peers whose work is happening at the same time as us. This feels like a really long way of saying that 
vagus nerve stimulation wasn't a single aha moment. Absolutely not. I've heard this story told many times, in many ways, by many people. I imagine that each teller has his or her bits of truth mixed in. Glorious it is, but it does not involve just one person or just one laboratory, as the New York Times article made it out to be. The patients listed in the New York Times article were actually patients of other physicians, in fact. And what if I told you that Northwell Health or the Feinstein Institute wasn't even listed as a clinical trial site for the study? And even the principal investigator for this trial that explored vagus nerve stimulation for arthritis treatment was a European clinical trial site. But more on that a bit later. I actually do know this part of the history fairly well. A lot of people from a lot of institutions were involved. As with every clinical trial, there are untold people involved behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and everywhere in between. A lot of people don't know the other characters in the story too. The sad thing is that people in the field don't talk about this enough either. This is Scraps by Electronic Medicine. And you are listening to our special mini-series, The Inflammatory Wanderer. We're going to talk about how neuromodulation for swollen joints and other inflammatory disorders are potentially going to be tackled, with special focus on the wanderer, the notorious vagus nerve. Before we dig any further, let's take stock. Let's see how this step of innovation would have been taken for a neurosurgeon who had just finished his training and be exposed to an emerging area of vagus nerve stimulation for immune inflammation. So what are you trying to say, Arun? Spill it. I'm saying the following. Vagus nerve stimulation for rheumatoid arthritis clinical trial is a momentous poster child for bioelectronic medicines. But we are totally challenging the narrative that it was one man's ingenuity that led to this invention. And on top of that, I need to convince you that the field existed long before this type of narrative came to be common practice. But Arun, I was there. Maybe not for the 2002 inflammatory reflex paper in Nature, but I was there for the 2013 Feinstein GSK Boyden Slowey Lit Nature letter. You know the one where we're still calling it electroceuticals? So I do know it, and better than most people do. Well, that's the nature of the game. But let's start from the beginning. Just in the last year, the United States' premier funding body, the National Institutes of Health, has unveiled funding in excess of $20 million per grant for studying the vagus nerve. While we could take many different directions with the vagus, we have chosen to start with the current trend, and even one can say a poster child for bioelectronic medicine, for immune-mediated inflammatory disorders like arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. Let's talk about the disease itself, but rather than just talk about painful and inflamed joints that affect the small bones like the ones on the feet, etc., Let's talk about things that will make the information about disease memorable because, you know, Dr. Google can help everyone else with disease etiology. So I know that you're talking about arthritis, but to help you, our listeners, understand things better, we're going to start with looking at things pretty broadly and then more narrowly quite soon. Yeah, before you make any judgments, let me tell you something. This was something that I wrote up for the episode as research points and... You know uh, the feeling as a scientist that when you have spent some time working on something only to turn around and be scooped by somebody else? That happened to me in the last couple of months. I was researching the cause for arthritis, etc, etc. I bounced upon this interesting factoid of a nature paper published in 2014 from Harvard, MIT and Max Planck Institute. And I wrote it all up only to take my dog out for a walk and open Spotify to listen to podcasts. And then I switched on to the most recent Radiolab podcast then. And I went, ah, Radiolab got there first before me. Huge kudos to Radiolab's Latif Nazar for talking about his IBD diagnosis and the amazing history behind it all in the episode titled Neanderthal. Oh shit, Arun, that sucks. At least we know they won't go into the depths that we will. So let's just let it go. And you can tell me about this ancestral sex that was ratified by Harvard geneticist. Well, as you know, humans evolved from two distinct species, Homo erectus 
living in Africa, and a bunch of them went away for whatever reasons. Obviously unhappy over the feud they had with family over Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Anyways, these dudes and dudettes moved to Europe and became Neanderthals. Yeah, you have papers and news media alerts that pop up every now and then that says, Neanderthals had this, had that, blah, 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 blah. Yes, and the Homo erectus ancestors who were left in Africa eventually evolved to become Homo sapiens. And through genetic study of Neanderthal fossils and comparing that to people from Sub-Saharan Africa, a bunch of non-African test samples of current folks, they found that the old ancestors, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals sowed seeds in each other's wombs. And the manner in which it happened is why some of us, Homo sapiens, ended with parts of Neanderthal DNA. Oh, that's really interesting. I thought it was only HIV that spread from one species <laughs> yeah, to another. These Neanderthals adapted to their environments in Europe, which was distinctly different from Africa, and started having different changes to their genome and microbiome that colonized their gut, skin, and hair and made them prone to some infections. Yeah, and Neanderthals were more evolutionarily fit to survive in non-African environments. The big changes scientists found was in their skin, the keratin pigments, etc., that provided them with thicker insulation. In addition, the manner in which the Neanderthals acclimatized to the new environment also meant that they were also early experts in self-care and self-medication. They understood what they needed to do to experiment with plants around them and almost test out various hypotheses to satisfy the physical needs in health and disease. And this means that they probably harbored a different set of microorganisms to their African ancestors. Okay, but how so, do we know that? Three Neanderthals fossils were found that had a massive tooth abscess. An analysis revealed that samples from this abscess was loaded with plant DNA that existed alongside Neanderthal DNA. And the plant DNA that was found in abundance was that of poplar tree leaves, specifically the poplar bark. Poplar tree bark, really? Yeah, yeah, poplar tree bark. It's found a lot in Europe, which makes it really interesting. In fact, what makes it really interesting is the fact that poplar leaves contain slightly higher concentrations of salicylic acid, and that's... Aspirin. Holy cow, a painkiller. Were these the first ancestors who even tried to self-medicate a compound known to man in its natural form? Yeah, probably. I guess. I knew you were going to bring that back. Okay, so you're telling me that sex between two different species of ancestors who might have coexisted as led us to Homo sapiens being more prone to autoimmune disorders. So this made them more prone to gut disease and liver inflammation. And the evidence that Neanderthals and Homo erectus and their progeny mated and resulted in today's modern humans is found in some genetic similarities. But one theory of autoimmune disease is that genetic predisposition, which some believe comes from our ancestors who were prone to inflammatory disorders of the gut and the liver and our skin, that predominates in European temperate climes, compared to equatorial climes. Arthritis being one of the autoimmune disorders probably has a similar origin, but it can be difficult to say. Clear genetic markers are yet to be identified. And I remember you told me about bugs. Let's move from ancestor mating and genetic preponderance to bugs. Yeah, evidence to this comes from some clinical evidence that shows that patients with the rheumatoid arthritis have much higher levels of a bug called Prevotella capri in their gut compared to non-arthritic individuals. And that immune reaction to this bug might make them more prone in some way to the processes that target the joint tissue and leads to a degradation of the joint tissue that causes arthritis. In fact, there is a line of thinking among scientists that among the gut microbiota, there is both good and bad microorganisms and the presence of this bad bug, Prevotella capri, can outnumber and even reduce some of the beneficial bacteria in the gut that can predispose individuals to an altered imbalance and therefore making them predisposed to the development of autoimmune disorders. Okay, now that we have bugs and ancestor mating out of the way, stress plays a big part too, right? Yeah, this is where my favorite topic, autonomic nervous system, comes into play. The body's natural homeostasis 
is a constant interplay between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic in the most simplistic view, being the one that responds to the body's immediate needs, like a startle response or a fight-or-flight response when everything shuts down except for the most vital functions, heart rate, blood pressure, and increased blood flow to the legs to flee from danger. And the parasympathetic nervous system, which can be tuned, regulated, both by specific acts like breathing, meditation, yoga, as well as the electrical stimulation of the major parasympathetic nerve, the vagus that we are discussing, to regulate bodily function. So you can imagine how the sympathovagal balance can be up or down during stress and how this can trigger some of the issues associated with how arthritis can be triggered. Yeah, but before we go any further, it is important to clarify that while there are many theories like what we said, the exact nature of how rheumatoid arthritis can start in a specific individual is hard to ascertain at the current time. Such theories are the foothold of the microbiome community where they believe one day they can treat autoimmune conditions like arthritis with microbiome manipulation. But let's come back to bioelectronics. Prior to anyone exploring electrical modulation of the vagus, there were some OGs, original gangsters in physiology, who were exploring the role of what neurotransmitters did. And in this process of discovering various neurotransmitters and their physiological effect, scientists from the late 1800s through the 1930s did some remarkable work elucidating the mechanisms. With the rapid advancement in the pace of pharmaceutical discovery, these understandings in neurotransmitter mechanisms led to the development of blockers or activators of these receptors. And as a result, The way we think of the impact of what is currently referred to as the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system was spoken of using the language of pharmacology. Take this as an example. To most medical students or even pharmacology students, the way one describes and easily comprehends what the vagus nerve does is by understanding what the underlying neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, does. So medical students are usually taught a mnemonic to understand the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system in the language of a drug that blocks the very receptor that acetylcholine binds to. For example, For example, mad as a hatter. Delirium. Blind as a bat. Ocular symptoms. Dry as a bone. Anhidrosis. Dry mouth or dry skin. Hot as a hair. Fever. Bloated as a toad. Constipation. The heart runs alone. Tachycardia. Full as a flask. Urinary retention. And the one that I have all the time, red as a beak. Cutaneous vasodilation. So, if you knew what the function of a blocker of the acetylcholine receptors did, did you know what activation did? The exact opposite? Precisely. And the concept of balance between sympathetic, adrenergic to keep it simple, and parasympathetic, cholinergic, Systems keeping the body in homeostasis came about. But there is a problem with designating sympathetic and parasympathetic systems by generalizing it as adrenergic or cholinergic systems. Even sympathetic nerves, to surprise you even more, and why I believe that this is a problem, I want to tell you a fact. Some of the sympathetic nerves can have or can release acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So the generalization of sympathetic and parasympathetic is a simplified version of feast and feed versus fight or flight responses. So somewhere along the line, knowledge about patients with epilepsy and schizophrenia having higher sympathetic tone was determined in the 1950s and 60s. This led to a flurry of activity that led to the advent of a multitude of modulators of sympathetic nervous system in the brain, like the dopamine antagonists. But when this was happening, there was a remarkable study that was done in 1952 that showed for the first time that a compound called strychnine, which is an anticholinergic and also a glycine receptor antagonist. And if you listen to our psychedelic series, you would know that strychnine is an indole like LSD or other ergot alkaloid. And we're going to tell you a few steps that people undertook to make the first vagus nerve stimulation implant a success. And again, going back to our first point, it was in one person or one group 
but a series of studies that spread over five decades. Yet, we as humans still have the habit of compressing key discoveries to one eureka moment and most commonly one person. Strychnine causes an increase in epileptiform activity, and that's science speak for higher excitability, and this could be suppressed using vagal nerve stimulation. All of this stood dormant until a helical cuff electrode was developed by Cyberonics to stimulate the vagus nerve for epilepsy treatment. But the key thing to understand is the fact that knowledge of how vagus translates sensory information to impact organ function is even older. 20 years prior to the strychnine experiment that we just outlined, it was seen that even massaging or applying pressure to the carotid sinus that resulted in syncope which manifested itself as fainting or lightheadedness. The reason for this is because the vagus nerve runs alongside the carotid artery and is encapsulated in a sheath. This was followed two years later by two neurosurgeons, Bailey and Bremer, who showed that vagus nerve stimulation produced electroencephalogram or EEG changes. And finally, a year before the strychnine experiment was published, when a different set of authors cut the vagus nerve and stimulated the cranial end of the cut nerve that retained its connection to the brain. And when they did that, they noticed the changes in the electrical properties of the deeper regions of the brain, like the thalamus. And ultimately, in 1985, a dog experiment showed that vagus nerve stimulation led to an inhibition of electrical processes that led to termination of seizures. And three years later, the first patient was implanted by Penry and Dean at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. All these steps led to FDA approval of vagus nerve stimulation for medically refractory epilepsy. So we have a gap here. How does this matter to vagus nerve stimulation for RA? What am I missing? So now you imagine that you're someone who finished your clinical training around this period and have started your career in medicine and research. Along with deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, and vagus nerve stimulation that is doing rounds at conferences that you go to, you like any other scientist are starting to think, what if there is a link between mind and body and the nerves are tying the two together? Seems logical to me and something that anyone with training would do. But what if I told you that the knowledge of how nerves communicate inflammation to the brain was inspired from the work of others. Oh, you're not going to say what I think you're going to say, are you? Well, yeah, but not yet. First, let me introduce to you um, this person. I'm Linda Watkins. I'm a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And we work on a whole variety of topics, um, a lot of neuroimmunology, uh, primarily focused on pain, pain modulation, and developing new therapeutics for pain. When we spoke to her, she seemed like a very shy person, extremely knowledgeable, but also very, very open about how she even landed on the vagus nerve. And Linda Watkins got to study all of this in the early 90s, way before anyone from New York hit upon the idea for vagus nerve stimulation. That seems eerie. I thought Kevin Tracy published papers looking at TNF-alpha inhibitors and its impact on central nervous system in the 90s too. Yes, but as per PubMed, that does not occur until 1999. Linda Watkins's work preceded that by at least half a decade. Let's ask well, Linda. The work on the vagus is an outgrowth of the work that we had been doing up to that point, which was looking at the impact of, of stress on immune function, the old adage that when you get stressed out that you get sick. And we had focused on that for a number of years, but then what had come to be in the psychoneuroimmunology research literature was more of a focus on the opposite, which became very interesting, which is the flip case of how does the immune system talk to the brain and control it? Because if you think about the last time you had a really ugly flu and what you were going through, you are running a fever, you are sleeping a lot, even the bed sheets hurt, you didn't feel like partying till 4 a.m. 
All of these things were happening in addition to, in fact, all the components of your blood are massively shifted to have things in your blood that will not allow pathogens to replicate very rapidly yet stimulate white blood cells, your immune system, to proliferate very quickly, all in the service of trying to help you survive. And in the course of looking at the sickness response, from a pain background, I was very interested in the fact that even the bed sheets hurt. And we were trying to figure out from a variety of different aspects of sickness responses, how does the immune system talk to the brain? Because when you think about all those sickness responses, fever, sleep, changes in food and water intake, social interactions, pain, all of that is created by the brain. So how is it that the immune system can take over and, frankly, dominate and control what the brain is now doing? Massive changes in how the brain is functioning. And this is not a trivial effect. It's massive. So the question had become, how does the immune system do that? And the early thoughts was that it was going to be through the blood. That's what immunologists typically think of because the immune systems are floating around in the blood, Many of these cytokines, chemokines, other immune factors are in the blood. And so the natural thought was that the blood was going to carry these factors to the brain. But the problem was that in, at that point in time, it had not been proven whether any of these things could actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And frankly, um, the argument had been made um, around this same time that one should think about the immune system as a sense organ just like you have taste and smell and hearing and vision, that immune activation should be thought of as a sense. And the senses relay things through nerves. In fact, one must say that the argument wasn't even Linda Watkins. It, it, was, it was first, oh, I can, I can circle back to you. I'm blocking on his uh, name at the moment, which is a terrible thing. I can circle Linda back acknowledged to, to us in our interview that the foundation for this field was actually laid by... Besodowski. Hugo Besodowski was the name of the individual who put this forward uh, initially. And to think about the immune system as a sense organ. Who proposed that when a foreign antigen like a bug, or even things that the bugs can release, trigger a stress response that goes into the brain, triggers the hypothalamus, and then that communicate to the pituitary and move to the adrenals and release adrenaline that manifests as an increase in sympathetic signaling. What this guy Hugo Besodovsky showed in Linda's words was that the immune system should be seen as a sense organ. And when you now think about sensory systems, they communicate through nerves. And that was a heretical kind of a view at the time. So that we started thinking about how could you possibly get from the body to the brain And that brought us up to a psychoneuroimmunology research conference where we were hearing about this idea about the immune system as a sense organ and wondering about how could we go about that. And as typical in a conference, people leave the conference at the end of the day and they head to the bar to commish with other people and think about the day and and just kind of think about ideas. And we were talking at the bar over beers, trying to to think about how could we approach it, because it was a very fascinating idea. And um, we now had Dwight Nance, a good friend, um, a wonderful anatomist and and psychoneuroimmunology researcher, happened to be seated at another table, leaned over and said, it's the Vegas. And it was Dwight. So and we, as soon as he said that the vagus made such sense, when you start thinking about, as you know, all the anatomy of the vagus and where all those terminals end, one of the things that we ended up finding out, taking Dwight's idea and running with it, um, was that there actually are end organs to the vagal terminals that bind to and get excited by immune factors like interleukin-1. So now you can have local immune release of, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, as an example, and a direct, relate, a direct avenue for activating peripheral sensory neurons and carry that to the brain. Because the vagus is, people think of as outflow. But in fact, a great majority of, of the vagus is, in fact, sensory, not just outflow. And so it's a two-way street. So, and so Linda and her husband took this idea and tested it and found that liver was a sensory organ that was transmitting the signal. In fact, 
if you listen to some of the talks from the early 2010s on the subject, it's always banded about, about the hepatic vagus being the sense organ. And a huge DARPA grant was awarded to the Feinstein Institute at this point to show what the vagus signaling was when an inflammatory agent like bacterial toxin that is routinely used in laboratory studies called lipopolysaccharide was injected. What came out of that work is for everyone to research and find out. But the credit for the idea was not unique to one person, but was Linda Watkins's and Hugo Besedowski's work. And it was also around the same time that people were actually proposing that there was a great amount of kind of nutrient sensing that was that was going on uh, through the vagus fr- from the stomach, isn't it? Especially through the ghrelin mechanisms and all the things that was associated with with satiety. I think one of my good friends uh, from Australia, University of Melbourne, I think he was somebody who was looking at that purely from a pharmacological perspective. And we were working in the pharmaceutical company GSK at the time. I mean, he actually ran quite a lot of those. John Furness uh, at the University of Melbourne actually ran quite a number of assays for us at the time, looking at ghrelin receptors and how that can actually induce satiety. And in fact, all of those kind of travels to the brain via the vagus. Um, so, Right, right. And from a different organ p- point of view, if you think about the liver that is now screening the blood as it's filtering through, there are specialized cells called Kupfer cells, which is a kind of a macrophage that's resident inside the liver. It turns out that there's a tremendous immune to brain as well as immune brain to immune bidirectional communication to the liver to those immune cells. So it's actually is another pathway as well as how the brain can control immunology just as the immunology can control the brain all through the liver. So here we must step back and understand the physiology of how reflexes work. I specifically love this example of reflex that you have mentioned before. Think of how a person can feel lightheaded upon standing up quickly from lying down, and the pressure sensors then kick in to make the heart beat faster to get more blood to the head, so that the lightheadedness can pass quickly. That's a reflex, correct? Yes. The information that inadequate blood flow to the head is happening upon someone standing up from lying down, it triggers the carotid baroreceptors, which fires in return to make the brainstem send signals to the heart to make it beat faster. Similarly, the thinking was that if something was sending signals up to the brain, like in the case of the hepatic branch of the vagus nerve, then what happens to that signal once it reaches the brainstem? Yeah, and was that where the whole idea for the subdiaphragmatic vagus uh, or subdiaphragmatic vagotomy kind of came to be? Because around that time, especially with rodent experiments, I think it was very difficult to to actually perform a cervical vagotomy, right? Because the rodents don't tolerate vagotomy as much as what larger animals do, like dogs or pigs, uh, at, at least on the surgical table uh, to start right. with. Right, and bilateral is deadly. So It's deadly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's kind of a problem for, for animal research experiments. So we ended up collaborating with Lisa Gaylor, who had come to uh, the Boulder area to actually study with Tom Finger at at, the University of Colorado, Denver. They do fish and chemo reception and things like catfish. So she was actually a catfish expert, but along the way had learned how to do subdiaphragmatic vagotomies. And we became good friends um, through the university, and I learned that she was a vagotomy specialist. And so she started collaborating with us on those kinds of projects because she knew how to do that surgery and taught us how to do that. So the subdiaphragmatic vagotomy allows um, for very good survival of the animals. And even better is when we realize the importance of the, the liver, there's a little branch that comes off right below the diaphragm and shoots over to the liver. So you can clip that and leave virtually the entire vagus intact and still block a lot of this immune to brain communication. So it became a very lovely, very easy on the animal surgery to to do, to be able to investigate how the immune system is talking to the brain. This is really interesting. So what you really want to drive home in this episode is that discoveries don't happen in a vacuum. There's always something that precedes a discovery, and this story is not told enough. It gets reduced to a schematic in a review or presentation. 
There are another few interesting bits of information that routinely get ignored. Yes, prior to the experiment being tried where the vagus nerve was cut, and the caudal end, or the end away from the brain towards the body was stimulated to reduce cytokine production, when the animal blood cells, the macrophages, were then challenged with lipopolysaccharide, the bacterial endotoxin. There were few curious sets of studies that showed that nicotine, the ingredient that's present in cigarettes, but also plays an essential part in the parasympathetic receptor mechanisms, leads to a reduction in inflammatory bowel disease symptoms. In fact, there was even a randomized control trial looking at this. Oh yes, and there was also another study where they looked at the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease in smokers and found that smokers had less inflammatory bowel disease incidence. And another study pointed to the role of the vagus nerve in modulating lymphocytes, a type of white blood cells, release. So, what we are really asking is the following. Is it really that big of a stretch for someone to conclude or even hypothesize from all of these results that we just explained to test the impact of vagus nerve stimulation on RA, knowing very well that vagus nerve stimulation releases acetylcholine that would ultimately end up acting on nicotinic receptors? You just have to be careful and meticulous to look at all the breadcrumbs. And if you're a neurosurgeon with a penchant for following breadcrumbs, you don't just eureka your way to a nature paper, but perform a systematic testing. So from there, from a subdiaphragmatic vagotomy, which was looking at the sensory mechanisms uh, of transfer of information from the inflammatory cytokines sensing to the brain, um, that... Over time, I think through some of the work that, that you had actually done in collaboration with, with Kevin Tracy, that had actually turned to vagal stimulation. And most of your work, if I'm correct, I think showed that there was a sensing mechanism and whenever the subdiaphragmatic vagotomy was performed, this cycle was actually, the cycle of transfer of sensory information was, was interrupted. Um, and that reflected in changes in both periphery in the blood as well as in terms of changes in the brainstem, etc., that, that, that you could have studied. Um, and around the same time, I think Kevin had also kind of done quite a bit of work injecting some of the anti-TNF molecules, the inhibitors, into the brainstem, uh, inspired by a lot of work that was going around at the time. And he found that in one of his earlier papers prior to 2000, I think he had found that that was also um, a brainstem-like mechanism. Was that the driving factor for ultimately the area, especially Kevin's lab, exploring vagal stimulation? Oh, absolutely. Um, Kevin's, Kevin was the uh, initiator of all that work in terms of the vagal outflow and had noticed not only from... He, he had known our work and was very intrigued by the work that we had been doing with the vagal input to the brain, and he as an MD thinks of bidirectional communications all the time, and this is one of the things that came to his mind, that if there's a, a vagal input that is pro-inflammatory, might there be a vagal output that could be anti-inflammatory? And along the same kind of lines is to, to keep in mind the importance of this work of the vagus as an immune-to-brain communication, because what that also led to and is not the, the reflex output that you're talking about, but is related to it, is that this is one of the ways that people came to realize the importance of glia. The entire huge field now of glial regulation of neuro, of neuro function came about in large part because of this work on immune-to-brain communication. Because what they found out was how you're getting fever and how you're getting changes in food and water intake and how you're getting all these changes is actually because the immune system activation in the body signaling to the brain led in turn to the activation of glial cells and the recapitulation of the release of new pro-inflammatory cytokines released from inside the brain. And that led to the whole field of, of recognizing the importance of glial cells, not only in terms of fever, but also in terms of pain, which is now a huge field of research. 
So it led to a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah, we do romanticize and even blow out of proportion a single event, ignoring all the studies that came before. I think this is something for us all to think about. What's the root cause? Why do we do that? And if we don't acknowledge who came before us adequately, beyond just citations in our research papers, the questions we need to ask ourselves is who are we misleading? Ourselves or the future citizens of science? Well, it doesn't just stop there. Again, what if I told you that the move to vagus nerve stimulation for arthritis was not necessarily that was magicked out of someone's head on the U.S. East Coast, as cited in the New York Times article, but was systematically proven elsewhere. Wait, wait, what? Wait, what? We shall find about that one too. The Inflammatory Wanderer is a Scraps original miniseries produced by Arun Sridhar and Jojo Plack. The research for this series was conducted by Arun Sridhar. Personal interviews you hear were conducted by Arun Sridhar and Jojo Platt. Editing was performed by Arun and Swaminathan Tirinyana Samandam was our sound engineer. He makes us sound wonderful in your ears. 